I didn't type the thing in. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Oh, just me. Of course you can. Yeah. Yeah. I won't be there the entire time, but I'll be there for a little bit. Oh, yes, I'll see it. Oh, good job. Oh, my gosh. You are good. You are nuts, but it works. <laughs> Woo! Yay! So awesome. <laughs> everybody it's good to see you I get to look in all of your eyeballs you know that's my favorite thing when I come up here some people are like I'm so nervous and I'm like I get to look at everybody's eyeballs that's so cool I can't see your eyeballs online but I know you're here with us and that's awesome so good morning um, let's just do announcements and then we can um, move it over to praise and worship which is so refreshing to be able to worship together Okay, so big day. It's Harvest Fest. Yay! Oh my goodness, a lot of hard work has been put into this, and it's going to be awesome for our kids to keep them safe and um, give them their treats and hop them up before we, we're going to move the time back, right? We're going to, tonight before we go to bed, move the time back. Don't forget, because tomorrow then you'll be all goofed up. So daylight savings, people. Um, about Harvest Fest tonight, if you have a table set up by four, it's very important. Set up by four. And I think that is my only emergency announcement for that. That's like set up by four. And then um, next on the agenda would be the Faithful Families game night, which is November 7th. Um, donate a game. Bring a game. So then you can leave it there and we'll have games to play in the future. That's kind of the whole idea. So that's from five to eight. Mercedes is running that. And the Women of Faith is, the women's getaway is officially closed. There's, we've got more than enough registered, which is exciting. Um, but we, not all have paid. And so we need payment by today or by Monday, I believe, right? Monday? And then um, make it out to Harvest Time Church South. And I'll divvy up and send it to the right place. And then, oh, if you want to go and you missed the sign up, so it's a cabin in Shatek. Just let me know your name, and I'll put you on a standby. So if somebody can't pay, then we'll, you'll be next in line. So good deal. Community kids coming soon. There are three different branches. So the only, I think there are two, right, that are set up and running. So we've got the creatives, Harvest Time Community Kids creatives, and JoLynn and Kayla are going to be running that. So that will be the first and third Tuesday of every month from 1030 to noon. Register online. And then um, me, Sarah, and Anna are running the Harvest Time Community Kids Explorers, which is more set on, um, you know, real workshop learning for maybe some of the older kids. So some of them have age limits and some don't. So you just have to register online. That's up and running. And you can pay online if you wish. So that's exciting that we are trying to figure out our system more. And we're being able to, we're just advancing in our knowledge <laughs> and our technology. And then I think that might be everything, unless I'm wrong. Somebody can say something. Pastor Adam, Pastor Adam. I usually leave something out. We're wonderful. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do have extra ones, but okay. you did everything, Yay. everything right. Good. I'm almost on vacation. Um, oh, that's right. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> oh, it's super.
allow that to be done by the government. However, we will uh, pass that along. And so if your child has it, uh, we can let the parents in, you know, in nursery know, or we can let the youth group know. So as it increases, we are obviously, that does not change our trust in a sovereign God, uh, but we're just trying to, this is how we are going to respond uh, as, we, as we move forward. A um, couple other things. Harvest, Harvest Fest is tonight. Yay. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a lot set up uh, last night, tables and tents and the fire pit and pumpkins and all kinds of stuff. It's going to be a blast. I'd encourage you to come. Otto! So if you're going to do a table, we're asking that you would get there. I don't care when you get there, but as long as your table is set up by 4.30ish, uh, because it starts at 5 and people tend to come early once they start seeing things and people start assembling. So if you could have it set up by 4.30, that would be awesome. If you did not sign up for a table, but you would like to, even you onliners, uh, you could just come on down in your costume and stand behind a table and pass out candy uh, so that we have a great uh, event for the community to partake in awesomeness. I have one last announcement. It is a little bit bittersweet. A little bit bittersweet. Um, to my right is the lovely Jill. Um, and she has done an amazing job as our admin these past many months. Um, and that has not changed. And we love her and appreciate her. Um, it's just something within, within the family and not being able to do office hours that we had to um, hire Lori in her place. Lori Lowenhagen will be the new admin. Um, but it's nothing, I just wanted it to be known so there's no gossip that uh, we are very, very, very happy and blessed for, um, with the work that uh, Jill did for us and for our church and will continue to do uh, just in different area and positions. And so we thank her for that. I just, I didn't want the word to get out when I was gone and there to be weirdness about it. So thank you, Jill. I'm just going to pray for you quick. That'll be fun. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for my friend Jill. I thank you for everything that she has done for our family and for this church and the sacrifice of, of time and of prayer and of tears for us. And I just pray, Father, that, uh, that you would just walk close beside her, that you would bless her, um, and that you would reveal the path that you have uh, for her ne next step in, in serving you. Father, we just pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Super straightforward. Eat, drink, whatever you do. Whatever you do with your time, whatever you do with your money, wherever you put your eyes, however you vote, <laughs> whatever you do, do it for the glory, the glory of God. And so I will just pray that that our service here, that our songs and our, and our worship and our hearts and everything we do throughout the week would be about the glory of our great God and nothing else. Amen. Heavenly Father God, as we come into your presence, as we worship you, as we, as we sing, Father, we, we pray that our hearts are giving you glory, that our songs and our lips and our minds are focused on you, uh, the living God, on, on your Son, Jesus, our Savior and Lord, that you would receive glory. Father, that, that as we walk out this life <laughs> tomorrow and the next, that our focus would be less on ourselves and more on you, that our focus would be more on your glory and less about our, our safety or our preferences or our comfort, but on your, on your glory, on your great name. Father, help us. Help us to bring you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Let's stand. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. mighty hand with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm his love endures forever for the life that has been reborn his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing praise God is with us. 
rising to the setting sun His love endures forever And by the grace of God we will carry on His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong Forever God is with us God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever and ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new Dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Sing bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. No, my soul. Worship is holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. No, my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. Worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. 
like never before. Oh, my soul, worship your holy name. Yes, I worship your holy name. Yes, I worship your holy name. Oh, to think about being able to worship you for all eternity, Lord. Being able to be in your presence without having the weightiness of the earthly realm and the problems that we have. Lord, to be able to be in your presence and be totally unattached and free and full of joy. Lord, I know that you can give that to us here. We don't have to wait till heaven to experience that. God, your cross did it all. Your cross did it all and has given us complete access into your realm, into your realm where you've placed a door where we have to knock and you always answer. God, you always answer. And when we seek, we find you. When we seek you with all of our heart. And so we sing and we seek you with all of our heart. Cherish the on rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the on rugged cross and exchange it some. For a crown on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinner was slain so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross until my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see for twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me cherish the old rugged cross till my 
trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. Cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Heavenly Father, God, we just pray the words of that song. We thank you for that cross. We thank you for your son. We were lost in our sin without without you and without hope, and you rescued us. You chased us down. You broke in. You overcame our complaints and our doubts and our fears, and you gave us eternal life. Father, I pray that that crown that eternity with you, that that would spark real joy in this life, Father, that our hope and our reward and our glory with you would bring us real life and real joy and real strength, uh, even as we stand here in, in Mondovi. Thank you for that cross. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. I think I have one last announcement. Sorry. That is, the Lori who is the admin is not Lori, my mother. It's Lori Lowenhagen. I don't know if I made that clear. <laughs> don't ask my mom anything. Um, yeah, unless you wanted the job. No? Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, don't you all be running away the next month? Don't you all be like, you know, pastor's gone, we don't have to come to church kind of a thing. Okay? So... You all come, and we're still going to be having work days every Saturday uh, to get our building done. The stuff is approved. The contractor's on board. We're already doing demo. They're starting their stuff on November 9th. Hopefully, we'll be making all kinds of progress while I'm away. I expect the church to be all finished when I get back. So if you guys could make that happen, uh, that would be great. Okay, so here we go. This message is sort of political. Uh, I apologize. You might want to leave now uh, if you know what my politics are and it offends you. Um, (laughs) I do my best to avoid uh, political issues most of the time as this country, this nation is not not our home, but heaven is. And the president is not our our king. Uh, Christ Jesus is, and to him our allegiance lies. And so um, 95% of the time our focus really is not on this nation or on the politics, but is on is on our king and is on heaven. Uh, There is an intersection, I think, of responsibilities, responsibilities as citizens of heaven and and, uh, citizens of of this nation. And so, despite being urged (laughs) uh, not to, I'm going to talk about about Elijah from 1 Kings chapter 18 uh, and the confrontation with uh, the Baal-worshipping prophets on Mount Carmel. 
And I will be making some observations um, about who I think some of the characters may be. Uh, and so you, again, like I said, have been warned. And so if you would like to, you know, have a fond memory of Pastor Adam uh, in my absence, you know, you might want to just, I don't know, pray super hard uh, that, 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 uh, that stays the same. Uh, so in three days, who knew this? In three days we'll be having elections. Woo! So it's a giant climax, right, of, of four years of nonstop political uh, struggle. It is a pivotal moment, a pivotal moment uh, in, our, in our nation, just as uh, the showdown in Mount, Mount Carmel was a pivotal moment in the, the nation of Israel. It was a day uh, for them to decide if they were going to worship God or if they were going to worship uh, the Baals. It was consequential. And I think in this nation, the political left and the political right agree uh, that this is a significant moment. I've heard uh, from both sides that this is the most important election in the history of our, of our world and all of this stuff. And they're both saying, and I don't think it necessarily is hyperbole, that this may be the last free election or this may be, uh, you know, winner take all kind of a deal. And so in the story leading up to uh, the confrontation of Mount Carmel. We have King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and they're reigning over, over God's nation, right? They're reigning over the nation. Um, and we know a little bit about Ahab and Jezebel. They're turning the hearts of the people away from the living God, and they're chasing, chasing after idols. Uh, they had silenced uh, the truth in Israel by killing the prophets. Uh, Obadiah was a cool prophet, and he hid some in caves. But most of the prophets had been killed. Their voices uh, were silenced. We are obviously not there yet in America. Um, we are not there yet. Uh, but there is a sense where there is a silencing of God's word in America today. There is a silencing that is happening in businesses and in TV and in movies and across uh, the media spectrum and universities uh, where they say if you, if you speak of the things of the Lord, if you speak of God and of godly morals, uh, we will shut you down, we will, we will fire you, we will boycott you, uh, we will silence you, we will silence you. And so um, not to the same degree, but in our nation, there is a silencing of the truth of God um, as our nation goes, goes astray. And in the story of Elijah, God brought a drought upon the land. He brought a drought uh, by the word of Elijah. It was a wake-up call. It was to serve as a wake-up call. And um, not to make too many direct parallels, but we have a, a plague. I'm not doing anything important. Don't, don't mind me. Uh, we have a plague of sorts in our land, and I do believe that it is, that it is a wake-up call, that, that people would get serious, that we get serious. Uh, Okay, so first scripture, first Kings chapter 18, verse 1 goes like this. It says, After many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, that's the third year of the drought, in the third year saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And so God set the stage for Mount Carmel. He set the stage for this uh, confrontation uh, between him, himself and these false gods. He, he set the stage by getting their attention uh, with the three years of drought and famine. And in that verse, when he says, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain, we see that God is sovereign over these things, right? That he's sovereign over rain, he's sovereign over the floods, he's sovereign over, over plagues, right? And when he says, I will do it, you just go show yourself to Ahab and I will cause it to rain, we see that, that, that Elijah knows what God is going to do. God knows what God is going to do. It's, it is certain God has ordained that rain is going to come. Um, he is going to bring it about. Elijah is sort of being useful in this process. But this confrontation um, on Mount Carmel with, uh, with the Baals, um, it isn't going to ultimately influence anything. God has, a, has sent a plague or has sent a famine. Um, there's a confrontation that's going to happen happen, but the rain is going to come either way is the point, is that he is sovereign and that he's doing these things, that the outcome of this confrontation was predetermined. It was ordained. The point that I'm trying to make is that God is sovereign over this. He's sovereign over, over Elijah and over Israel, and he's sovereign over the U.S. and over our elections, right? Sovereign. The person who gets elected, uh, whenever that may be, uh, whenever we find out, uh, that person uh, will be elected because God wants that person elected. Okay? Ultimately, that is in his control. He invites us to do work. He invites us, like he invited Elijah, uh, to take a stand and to be a part of the things of God. And for these things, we are going to, to give an account, right? 
We give an account for the fruit that we bear. We give an, uh, an account for the effects of our life, of, of the influence that we had, of the, of the things and the, the causes that concerned us, right? What is the, the impact of our lives? And we're going to say, in the days when God was being silenced from America, did we, was our voice heard? <laughs> did we vote? What did we vote for? Did we vote for the things of God? Did we vote about life and religious freedom? Or did we vote for other folks, right? Did we run for office? Did we support school boards that honored the word of God? Or did we did not vote for them or not, not care? Did we pray? The point is, what did we do? What did we do at this pivotal moment? What did we do at the time when God was being silenced from our land? What did we, what did we do? Chapter 18, verse 17 through 19, Ahab comes out to meet Elijah, so things are heating up. It says, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Ahab says, is it you, you troubler of Israel? It's, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, we, and I hear this all the time. We hear this all, the world, the media, all the institutions, they're always blaming uh, the Christians, they're always blaming the Judeo-Christian values as the problem, as the trouble uh, in America, that our stance on, on God's word, that our stance on marriage, that our stance on creation, that our stance on the sanctity of life, that our stance on what morality is, that that is the problem, that that is evil, that that is bigoted, that that is hateful, calling the good evil and the evil good. And Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel but you have. You have. Right? And so Elijah stands in defiance of King Ahab, and he says, I stand in defiance of you. I stand in defiance of your wickedness. I stand in opposition to everything that you're trying to do. I stand in defiance of that. It is not us, <laughs> is what Elijah says to Ahab. It is not us. It is not the prophets of God who are troubling Israel. And I would say it is not us uh, Christians. I would say this to America. It is not us, you know, who has who has brought this trouble on the land. It is not us who has polluted uh, the nation with false ideas and false God. It's not us who taught children that there is no God in school. It is not us who confused their gender and their sexual identity. It is not us who is destabilizing homes and doing uh, these things. It is not us. It is not us. And so after these, these pleasantries, <laughs> um, there's a major spectacle, and the, the confrontation is about to happen. There is this national uh, decision, verse 19, it says, Now therefore send and gather all of Israel to me in Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah calls everybody. He calls everybody. All of Israel. There's a showdown, essentially. I mean, it's really about God, but essentially it's Elijah and Ahab are having this, uh, this showdown with one another. Um, but the entire nation gathers to witness how it will turn out. The entire nation uh, is going to give their approval or their uh, support to the victor. Um, but the confrontation isn't, isn't just about Ahab. It isn't just about Elijah. It's about who stands with them. Right? Elijah stands with God. He stands basically alone on the mountain. Ahab stands with Queen Jezebel. She stands with the 450 prophets of Baal. She stands with the 400 prophets of Asherah. Uh, and so too, uh, that's what's going on in, in our elections or any elections. You're not just voting for a party. You're not just voting for Trump or for Biden. You're not just voting for this senator over that senator. You're voting for what those people represent. You're voting for the people who stand behind them, for the ide ideology that is in, in their corner. And I've said this probably 20 times throughout the lives this year um, as everything was heating up and the things that were going on in the summer. Whose camp are we in? Whose camp? Who are we standing with? Whose tent are we sleeping in? Right? Elijah's standing basically alone. He's standing uh, with his God and, with, and Ahab is standing with the enemy, with Satan and with uh, these, these prophets. And this will be probably the most political part of the sermon. Um, it is perhaps not as stark, um, but I do think it's important uh, to note that the, the leftist groups, um, like BLM, not the, the slogan, we all agree uh, that Black Lives Matter, we all agree that every life matters and any injustice should be met with um, justice. Uh, but the organization of BLM 
and, and Antifa have killed literally hundreds of people. This is, this is not right-wing propaganda. This is truth. Uh, hundreds of people. They've been assaulting thousands of people in 50 cities across the country uh, for months. They've set dozens of churches on fire in this country. They've set hundreds of churches on fire in Europe. I don't know if you knew this was a global thing. Um, they've called for the tearing down of statues of Jesus. The co-founder of BLM, uh, Patricia Colors, I believe is her last name, I listened to a, an interview she did, and she was bragging about invoking uh, spirits uh, to help the cause, to aid in their cause. Um, I heard that the... She is a witch. I heard that the Satanic Temple uh, endorsed Mr. Mr. Biden. Um, I looked at the American Atheist website to see what's going on there, and it's all anti-family, anti-God, uh, anti-Trump. 83% of atheists are voting for Biden. Uh, the Muslims are as well. There as well. He said that they would serve in every level of administration. He said in one of his things that uh, that he wished that the Islamic faith was taught more in our schools. So we cannot learn about Jesus Christ, we cannot lead about, learn about the Bible, but we're going to push Islam on our kids uh, at school. And so Islamist groups from Gaza to Iran to Michigan, Dearborn type, uh, are supporting that party. They're standing in that camp. Uh, there's witches doing mass spells and rituals on this very night uh, for, Mr., for Mr. Biden. You know, I look at the Christian movements, I look at the calls for repentance on Washington, D.C., praying for our nation, praying that God would have mercy on us. And I see, um, I don't see any of the left wing organizing these things. I don't see them organizing mass movements for prayers or for our Jesus. I don't see them calling for repentance. I see them removing God uh, from the pledge, removing God from the schools, removing God from their national platform and attacking the Christian faith of justices and politicians and all of these things. I'm not saying that all uh, Democrats are evil. I'm not saying that all Republicans are pure. I'm saying who's in your camp matters. It matters. It matters who you're standing with. It matters who you're standing with. Verse 20 through 22 says, So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Elijah says to him, make a choice. <laughs> You've got to make a choice. You have, to pick, you have to pick a side, and whose side are you on? He says you're limping. You're limping between two opinions. You're limping between two sides. Part of your life, you have, this, you have God in your life. Part of your life, you're embracing uh, evil, and, he's, <laughs> you know, and you love God, and you vote for people that despise your God. You, you, know, you say you love God, uh, and then you don't do anything about it. We cry about, and this isn't just to you. This is just the church. You know? We cry about our, our kids turning from the living God because they just teach atheism, atheism at school, or, or we, we cry about you know, the suicide because kids are taught that they're, they're just grown up from evolved sludge and that they have no hope and no purpose in the world. And we, and we cry about, you know, how the, the, the believing high schooler goes off to college and has their face stolen from. We cry about it. And then we vote for the people that are silencing God in those institutions. And Elijah says, how long are we going to go limping? How long are we going to go limping? It's an odd word that he says limping. Don't you think? It's not lukewarm. It's not... Confused, it's not apostasy, it just says it's limp. Uh, and I think the only other place that it's used in this book uh, is in the next couple chapters, in, ver, uh, in, in, chap, uh, sorry, in verse 26. He says, And they took the bull, this is when they're, the, the, the prophets of Baal are beginning to offer their sacrifices. It says, And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered, and they limped around the altar that they had made. So I think the wording is significant, significant that God wants us to see that this sort of limping in our decision or our indecision um, leads to a physical or to an actual lameness. Uh, they were limping around the altar because they were cutting themselves, as was their practice, and so they were really limping physical. There was real, real lameness, real sickness, real pain in their lives, and that's what we're supposed to see, I think, 
that this, this limping or this indecision with our allegiance or, or what the case might be causes an actual sickness or an actual lameness. And you can see that in our nation. You can see real sickness in our nation uh, from failing to choose, to choose God over other things. And I don't just mean like COVID or something or cancer. I mean like, like sicknesses of drugs and of alcohol and of abuse, sicknesses of human trafficking and riots and violence where it's just the norm that we would be people that are so, so evil. There's a sickness in this land. And whether you agree or disagree with the police officers in Philadelphia who shot the armed guy, whatever, a couple days ago, and then three days we have... We have hundreds and thousands, well, I think it was many hundreds of people who were assaulted. Some people were shot. Some people were killed. Just random strangers who happened to be on the streets of Philadelphia, caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, they were assaulted and some of them were murdered. It's irrational. It's a, it's a sickness that, is, that has found its way into, into our nation because we failed to, you know, to receive Christ and to be healed. Uh, verse 22 and 24 says, Elijah said to the people, I even I only am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bowls be given to us and let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Now, the first thing is God doesn't care about being the underdog. Does not, does not care. It's Elijah by himself. It's the 450 prophets of Baal, the other 400 garbage prophets. He doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't care at all. God can move. He can bring victory. He can bring revival. He can change the hearts of a nation. He can set up kings. He can do whatever he wants to do. And he actually prefers to be at a disadvantage. I don't know if you knew this about God. He really likes being at a disadvantage. He likes to find Gideon and say, you got too many soldiers, we're going to cut it down to 300. I know the hordes of Midian are like the sand of the seashore, you can't count it, and I'm going to throw 300 people against that 10 million because I want everyone to know that I am God and I am the one that did it. That's what God likes to do. He likes to wait till the old man, Daniel, 80 years old, is thrown into the lion's den before he moves so that people know that it's God who did the work. And you can look at throughout all the characters in Christ and Peter and Paul and how he likes that. <laughs> he likes it. Because he wants us to know that it is not the politician that changed the country. And it's not the institutions, it's not the power of personality. He wants his people to know that he is God and if change or blessing is coming, that he did it. Not a party or not a politician, but him, so that all glory would go to God. And the people say to Elijah, they say, that's, that's well spoken. Whoever answers by fire, that's well spoken. I'm like, this is so wild. He just told them, you're going to call on Baal, your God, and I'm going to call on Yahweh, our God, Jehovah God, uh, and whoever wins, we're going to follow. And they're like, oh, it sounds good. It sounds good. Oh, it's crazy. It's just that idea, whatever works, whatever is expedient, you know, wherever the fire falls, wherever the, 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 the blessing or, or the perceived you know, better thing for me is, I'll just go with that, whatever's better for me, uh, and that's, that's cool. <laughs> and I'll worship that, and I'll just do that, whatever, whatever is expedient. They should have just repented right there. They should have just said, <laughs> what do you mean, Baal's our God? Baal's not our God. And you know, they, should have, they should have repented, but they were so far gone, they did not, they did not even respond. They did not even respond. Uh, verse 27, it says, At noon, Elijah mocked them. That's fun. Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he must be a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Elijah, Elijah mocks them. It's one of our favorite, favorite stories about the mocking. Uh, Jesus, you know, occasionally mocked the Pharisees. You know, maybe a little bit of Herod. But Paul, you know, mocked the Judaizers, told them to castrate themselves, you know. So there is some mockery in the Bible. Uh, it isn't typically a good idea to use mockery as, a, as an argument. You know, most people don't, uh, don't turn from that. Don't, uh, don't, don't listen. Uh, but I think there's rare times, okay? There's rare times, and this is a rare time. 
Uh, it's a pivotal moment in the nation. I'm not encouraging you to do mockery. Uh, I'm just <laughs> encouraging you that it's significant. And so uh, he doesn't leave any punches unthrown. It's significant. He says, what is your, your false god? What is he doing? Is he pooping? Is he on vacation? You know, what's, what's he doing? Why isn't he answering? Where, where is he at? Uh, and I think it's, it's important to see the bigger lesson. The bigger lesson is that when you see people that are so self-destructive, when you see people who are cutting themselves and they're blind and they're following a false god and the stakes are high, like heaven and hell high, we're talking about eternity is now, not the, not the election. When the stakes are high and people are bleeding and dying without hope in a world, we need to say something. We need to say something, however, however you can do it. And if you've tried being sweet, if you've tried living the example of your life, and they're gonna, I'm going to testimony with my, with my life and, and not with words or whatever we always do, uh, at some point you have to get serious because this is serious. The stakes, the stakes are high, and, his, and Elijah's like, the stakes are high. These people are following a false god. I have to wake them up. And if it means being you know, mocking or abusive or what, I don't encourage any abuse or mockery, but you see what I'm saying. Like it is important, and we have to be people who understand that this is serious. This isn't a religion. These are real eternities. Hundreds of billions a year where people will spend either in heaven or in hell. And there's only one path that leads to life. There's only one path. Jesus Christ is the one path, the narrow road and wide is the path that leads to destruction. And so we need to be people who care about eternities, people who share, share Christ. Verse 28 says, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And at midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of oblation. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one attention. Uh, I read that. It says, we limped around the offering, was their, was their custom. And so what they do here is they just increase it. They say, let's just do it. Let's just do it more. It's not working. They're crying out. They're cutting themselves. They're raving. They're doing these things, but the only thing they know to do is to do it more. And so they increase it. We'll just do more of it. And that's what I, what I hear a lot when I, when, I, when I listen to politics. I hear through it, and I just hear this. I hear it's just the same lameness. It's just the same anti-God policies. It's just more socialism, or, or we'll just teach kids at a younger and younger age about sex, and we'll just sexualize them when they're, when they're preteens instead of when they're in high school, and we'll tell them it's okay to switch their gender when they're eight because then they'll get a head start on it, and they won't be as sad, and we sexualize dolls and, and cartoons and, and all of this stuff, and it's just more, it's just more cutting. It's just more... Lameness. It's just more attacking of, of the different values and the different things. It's just the same, the same thing. It's just the same practice. And it just led to more, to more lameness. In our story, no one answered, right? There's no power there. There's no power in the same things. There's no power in the wisdom of man. There's no power in any solution that doesn't have God in it. It's just more problems and more lameness and more depression uh, and, more, and more limping. The other thing about that Bail not answering because there's no such thing as bail. Um, is that no one an answer? No answer. Um, and that cut me. <laughs> that cut me. Because there's a lot of times where I'm praying to my God and, and he answers on a, on a personal level, you know, praying for you or praying for, you know, one of you out there. Uh, but I don't know how many times I've got in my face and cried for, for a revival in the city or a revival in the state or an awakening across America. And I'm sure you guys can, uh, would give voice that that's, that's your heart too. And with tears and, and, and praying and crying out, God, I want to see a revival. You know, we see millions of folks, you know, they go to D.C. and they march and they pray and they seek the face of the living God uh, for our nation. And it, it seems like there's no answer. And we're the only, we're the only people with a God. Where is, where is the answer? And as I was uh, thinking about that, I was thinking about this, this analogy of when Elijah tells the people that they're limping. He says the whole nation was limping. He says the whole nation was guilty. The whole nation was, was limping with a collective guilt, uh, with a, a collective lameness as, as, a, as a people. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15 came to mind as I was sort of like, what does this mean? Uh, and the verse says, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening because your hands are full of blood. Your hands are full of blood. We're going to talk a little bit about abortion. Um, God says, I'm not going to answer. I'm not listening. 
I'm not listening because your hands are full of blood. And the thing that struck me about, about that is that not everyone in Israel sacrificed the newborn uh, to Moloch. Not everyone in Israel sacrificed a kid to Baal. Not everyone murdered a neighbor or not everyone was, uh, was unjust to an orphan or to a widow or to an immigrant. But collectively, God says, you have blood on your hands. The whole nation has blood on their hands. He says you're guilty. He says you're guilty. The whole nation is guilty. Even though it wasn't every single person, you collectively are guilty. And, that <laughs> and when we think about abortion, and we have a page that has some stats, people talk sometimes but it just be an A issue, or I believe it's this, but I would never do it, but you know, I would never do it, but if someone else does, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's wild. I mean, they're babies. They're human beings created in the image of our God with souls, with, with eternities, that God knit them in their mother's womb with a plan and a purpose, that Jesus died, that he paid <laughs> the price for those, for those children. And when you look at the stats, it's staggering. It's just staggering. When you think about the global stats, whatever is one and a half billion since 1980, that's if every person in the Western Hemisphere, if every person in Canada, in the United States, in Mexico, in Venezuela, in Brazil, in Peru, in the Caribbean, all of them, that's 500 million. And then every person in Europe, then you're at about a billion, you're still not there. That's how many babies we've murdered. That's a lot of guilt. That's a lot of guilt. We think about just our country, 60-ish million, that's 10 holocausts. How guilty was was Hitler? We're 10 times, 10 times as guilty. We have blood on our hands. I think there's voices like, or verses, you know, where Cain kills Abel, uh, and, and the Bible, and God says to him, he says, the, the, the blood of your, of your brother cries out to me from the ground against you. It cries out. Like he hears. And that's this one, this one person. And so when I'm thinking about these prayers, we're praying for mercy and for revival. Um, and God looks down and he hears the voices of 62 million people crying out from the ground because we murder them. Because it is murder. And some of it's horrible murder. You know, there's some where it's a pill and it's painless, and there's some where it's knives and scalpels and suction tubes where they, I mean, at least the Nazis had the decency to do gas. You know, I mean, this is, it's a, it's a heinous injustice. And just since we opened, oh, we didn't have, when I opened it, just, just since he opened the page this morning, when I showed him this page, 7,697 kids have been, have been aborted have been murdered in an hour since we, whenever we set up the the slide. Anyway. I don't know. I mean, people say one one issue, one issue voters, and I I get the heart of that. I get there's other things uh, that matter, but we got to get that right. You got to get it right. We got to we got to purge that evil from this land, and then we can worry about social programs, and then we can worry about other things. Like we have to end this before before we are we are ended. This is my this is my view. Elijah in verse thirty through thirty five, he calls uh, the people to prepare the sacrifice. Uh, he said, "We're going to build it on twelve stones." I think that represents the twelve tribes of Israel. He says, "Pour the three basins of water on it." They do it over and over and over. So there's twelve jars of water. So he covering the wood and the sacrifice of the bull with water, not typically the way you prepare a fire, not the way I prepared to start fires, uh, but that's how he does it because God doesn't need help. He doesn't need Elijah to put tinder or, or kindling. Uh, he can cover it with water until it covers in uh, the whole thing because God is God and he can send a billowing fire with infinite power. He doesn't need any help, and so we can believe that. He doesn't need any help. He can overcome any obstacle. And then Elijah begins to pray. He begins to pray, verse 36. He says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. Let me just, this is a rabbit trail, but normally it says God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Here he he changes the name of Jacob for Israel, probably so the Israelites realize this is supposed to be your God. This is your God. 
This is the one that founded you and founded your nation. This is, this is your God. O oh Lord, God, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant and that I have done all of these things at your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let no one escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. So God does what only God can do. He sends fire from heaven. Uh, He consumes it all. It licks up the water, burns up the sacrifice, burns up the stone. It's all gone. When God shows up, we have power. All of, lots of religions around the world, lots of limping all around, and a lot of you know, false answers, but only God reigns. Only God has power, and when he shows up, the world sees it. And the people fell on their face, and they say the Lord. They say Yahweh is God, and Yahweh is God, and that's awesome. Um, and then Elijah, just like we saw last week with King Josiah, he purges Uh, the evil from the land. And so it's just another subtle reminder that we need to be people who are serious about our own sin, not just pointing fingers at other people for their apparent wickedness, but serious about our own sin, serious about fighting it for seeking holiness um, in our own lives. Uh, The sacrifice struck me. We are sort of closing it on the end. Uh, The sacrifice, uh, it struck me because he makes it very clear, and there's two sets of 12s. He says, get 12 stones, which I assume means the 12 tribes, Um, just like they had done. So when Joshua led the people across the Jordan River and God split the river uh, when the the feet of the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the Jordan, when they got to the other side, he told them to set 12 stones on the riverbank as a covenant and a testimony to the people that, that I am your God and I will bless you and you will follow me and I will be with you and I will wage these wars against you. Uh, And so when... I read this, I was like, I never saw this before. But the 12 stones that they used to make the altar and the 12 jugs of water, probably also representing Israel, they were all burnt up. It was all burnt up. Right? And so we have this great victory where God moved and where they saw his glory and they're like, this is what we pray for and the false prophets were purged. Everything is going exactly the way we wanted and what we prayed for. But to me, it's just like this foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing, obviously, of God's power and his worth, but it's a foreshadowing of the destruction that's about to come in Israel that we saw last time. In this moment that was their biggest victory was actually a foreshadowing that, no, no, you're not going to turn and you're going to be judged. And the point that I want to make is We shouldn't assume anything after the elections, okay? I mean, assuming we we actually are told who wins, which is a big assumption, but assuming we know, we shouldn't shouldn't assume anything from it, right? I mean, if Trump wins, it isn't like that is an automatic me, oh, God's blessing us and this is so great. We don't know that. You don't know that. It could ignite a civil war. We could have judgment tomorrow. I mean, it it could be the opposite, you know? A Biden election doesn't mean God's judgment on America. Even worst case scenario, you know, where religious freedoms are eroded and you can't pray ever again and they shut down every church in the land, that could be a blessing too, turning our hearts back to our king, you know, where we get serious about our faith and praying and evangelizing, meeting together in our homes. We don't know is the point. We don't know what, what it is. They thought this was a great thing when the, when the fire fell and actually, you know, the 12 tribes were burnt up in the foreshadowing of judgment. And so I would just encourage us to remember that God is in control and he sets up and he tears down and we just trust him. We don't exalt on election day over people being elected and we don't despair on election day over people being elected because our God is on the throne and he decides. And he decides. And we follow him and love him and serve him no matter who wins or whether, you know, we have anarchy or democracy or something in between. It don't matter. Our job doesn't change. Our job doesn't change. A um, couple more things, quick. Uh, the reason for the miracle, for the fire falling, is seen in verse 37. It says, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back that you have turned their hearts back. So the point wasn't so that the people would see that God could bring fire. The point wasn't that the people would know that God was sovereign over Baal. That's obvious. Uh, the point was for that the people, that the people would know that God is the one that turns hearts, that God turns hearts, that this is about hearts and it's about souls and it's about eternities. It's about God. 
And we have to remember that this entire story, this climax of Mount Carmel, actually isn't even what the story is about. The story is about there's a famine in the land. God says, I want you to go present yourself to Ahab, uh, and I'm going to bring rain. And he goes and presents himself to Ahab, and then they have this little showdown. But it isn't even about their showdown. It isn't about the prophets. It isn't about the fire. Uh, It's about God, and it's about about the famine. And the trouble, ultimately, for Israel wasn't wasn't Baal, and wasn't Ahab, and wasn't Jezebel. Uh, The problem in the land was there was no rain, and that there was that there was a famine. And so the same thing struck me this week, that the, the problem in America uh, isn't the things that we think it is. It isn't socialism or anarchy in the streets or violence. The, 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 the famine in the land is that there's 150 or 200 million or maybe 250 million people that go to bed every single night without Christ and without hope. That there's a famine in the land, that there's a lameness, that people are, are limping and, and struggling and dying without Jesus Christ every single day. That's the famine. That's the problem. That's the thing that God seek to address. Not that they would know that God can cause fire. Everyone knows that. But that they would know that he's the one that can turn hearts, that, that he's the one that could ultimately save. And that should be our focus too. That our focus would be that, that we would pray that God would break into people's lives, that he would cause eyes to see him and hearts to believe and souls to be saved, that they would say, <laughs> Jesus has turned my heart or Jesus got a hold of me and only God can turn hearts, that that would be the thing uh, that most concerns us, that the famine in our land of unbelief would be, would be rectified. Okay, that's what I got. We're going to close uh, with communion. Um, I just want to read before we do that what God told him. We read the verse about I'm not listening to you, I'm not answering your prayer because you all have uh, blood on your hands. Uh, verse 16, the next verse says, Wash yourselves and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Care about justice. Care about people. Then he says, Come, let us settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as white as wool. Only Jesus, only the cross has the power to save, has the power to cleanse what went before. Only Jesus has the ability to to wash the blood off a nation's hands, to make us, to make us clean, uh, to forgive us, to renew us. And God says, let's settle the matter. Let's settle it. Let's settle it today. And so, just encourage you, if you have not settled the matter in your heart that Jesus is your Savior and Jesus is your Lord, that you would settle the matter in your hearts today, that you would bend the knee to King Jesus, that you would be forgiven, that you would be set free that any lameness or despair or, or darkness that is caused from sort of limping in two different directions and being pulled by different allegiances, that that would be done away with as we bend our knee to Jesus and we are healed and we are cleansed and we are, we are set free. Uh, the way we're going to do communion together, and so as you, after you pray and whatever, uh, you can come up and take the elements of, of communion and go back to your seat and I'll come up and then we will... We'll take it together. Amen? Amen.
1 Corinthians eleven twenty three says, For what I received from the Lord, that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we take the bread, we just remember that it was our Jesus, who is God, the infinite Savior with all power and from all eternity past, he's the one that pursued us to earth. He's the one that died on that cross for us. He's the one that we could be forgiven, that we uh, could be set free. Let's take the bread. In the same way also, he took the cup, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only thing. It's the only thing that saves. It's the only thing that covers, that covers sin, that covers the blood on our hands that is our own guilt and we are covered in the blood of Christ and we are cleansed and we are made right and we are set free. 
And it says, as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. It's a proclamation of victory. It's not just saying that I believe that my Jesus died. It's that he died and he defeated death and he defeated hell and he defeated Satan. He defeated everything. That when we take the blood of Christ, when we identify with our Savior, and we are set free and forgiven, we are proclaiming to the world and to our enemy that we are victorious in Christ. That we are victorious. Let's take the cup. We're just going to linger in, in prayer and in worship. I just encourage you to spend uh, some time with your, with your Savior.
going to close with a, with a prayer. Heavenly Father God, I know that there are people here who think that, you know, that are worried about me being gone, <laughs> getting eaten by bears, Father. Um, and I'm worried about them. And I thank you, God, that you, that you are their shepherd that the building or COVID or elections or whatever comes, that you, Father, are their great shepherd. And so, Father, I just ask that you would protect them just as a shepherd would protect their sheep from wolves, Father, that you would protect them, that you'd be strong and mighty in their midst. you cover them with your wings, Father. God, that you'd provide for them just as a shepherd would, that you'd lead them to still waters and green pastures, Father, that you would meet their needs and, and bless them. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you'd be so close and so tender with, with all my friends. <laughs> I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
see. Trust the voice that speaks.